Well, welcome. Banks of all kinds, all sizes, all types, all over the world are facing tremendous pressures and managing challenges from all directions. They are engaged in digital transformation initiatives. They face ongoing pressure to create low friction customer experiences. They face challenge of figuring out how to leverage open banking and embedded finance to acquire new customers, create new products, and improve productivity. They're also dealing with an ongoing and ever-changing security and authentication and fraud threats. Banks face an ever-increasing multitudes of payment methods, devices, customer devices, and security and authentication methods. At the same time, they're managing and implementing PSD2, GDPR, open banking standards. In the face of all these challenges, they're also trying to manage the balance between customer privacy and the value of customer data. And finally, bankers all know this, you're doing this in the middle of a pandemic with all the implications of that, from your staff moving to working from home to increase demand and usage of digital banking services. These very pressures and challenges, though, make an opportunity for banks to address and change customer authentication methods. Today, we're going to address and focus on three areas that we think are impact customer authentication and the EMV Co standard regulations, customer experience, and digital banking technologies. We're going to look at this in terms of how banks must do, what they must do, how much must they do to achieve customer authentication, what are the opportunities to leverage their investment in customer authentication to step ahead of the pack, and in fact, become a use it as a competitive advantage with customers. So let's start first with the first challenge around regulation. Gerhard? Yeah, hi, Stacia. I, I think it's a, it's a tough time to be a bank. As you mentioned, all of these challenges, I can just uh, think of the audience going through that pain and, and, and realizing what lies for them once, once they finish this webinar. Um, it's becoming much more front of mind, even today, the various regulations that's coming into mind where we're hearing much more about companies pitching privacy, where PSD2 and open banking are standards that to some extent is in the, in the common man's uh, vocabulary. But it is, it's a challenge to be a bank. Um, they've got to deal with the card associations and new payment standards. In the US, it's faster payments. In Europe, there's this GDPR privacy um, wave running through, and at the same time, a PSD2 implementation. And, and to some extent, you know, there's even conflicts between the two. Um, so banks have got a, a tough thing to do. And, and I've, I've spoken to some banks that spend more than half their time just keeping up with regulation. Um, and then the payments modernization that's coming as, as, is, is, is causing them to have to almost change their, you know, plane while they're flying it to, to, to build it out. So I think it's, uh, it's, it's not an easy time to be a bank. And I think um, a lot of, a lot of, a lot of smart moves need to be made. I do think that there's an opportunity, but you need to get it right and get a significant competitive advantage if you, if you know where you're going and you take a strategic view and not just take it then as a sort of minimum only approach. So, so what do you think are the, are the big initiatives that banks have to deal with right now around uh, customer authentication and across all channels and lines of products and businesses, um, not just looking at say the banking piece, but the payments piece, what's causing all the, the commotion, if you will, regulation wise? There, I mean, there's a, there's a number of regulations we've mentioned. Europe is talking about the payment services director of two that's got a big anchor of it to be strong consumer authentication that, that is a way to authenticate the user. And it doesn't apply just to payments, it applies to getting access to accounts and and the, the the PSD2 regulation is almost the regulation that was brought in to untangle banks, increase competition. And um, that's that's already in force. The strong consumer authentication piece is coming out at the end of this year. 
early next year, there's, there's been some requests for extension. I've heard statistics that more than 60, 70% of the industry has not got it in place. At the same time, the card associations is driving a couple of new initiatives. The one that's probably front of center end of, end of next quarter, first quarter 2001, is a standard called 3 Secure 2. It's the replacement of that 2004 standard 3 Secure 1 that's hated universally around the world. And that standard is also um, setting a new protocol and a new way to do authentication. So there at least is two of these things that's trying to, to change how authentication works. Now, Ian Vico, yeah, sorry, go. So if, if I'm a bag, bank in the US though, or outside of Europe, why do I care about PSD2 and GDPR? Because you know that's not happening in the US. Correct, I think the US uh, is to some extent, uh, um, uh, shall we say a special case. Um, I think they're being hit by a lot more consumer action, consumer requests. Uh, the banks are being, uh, got the, the tech funds coming out with banking products, a number of pseudo banks uh, eating their lunch and, and coming for them. So they have to get the right consumer experience in place while preventing fraud from running right. Um, so the challenges for them is also um, being more open, adding new services and, and working in a world which has changed dramatically in the last six months and where digital first is digital only. You know, the, the one thing that, you know, we're seeing the US starting to adopt QR codes. But before it was never being considered and now a number of people are issuing QR for payments because of the contactless nature. Digital onboarding is becoming a dramatic increase. So I think getting the right digital customer and being able to authenticate them in a consistent way is universal across all of them. The reason why just changes, I think, depending on the regulatory framework. Do you think standards are important in all of this, the customer authentication and onboarding and, and fraud detection? How important is that going to be? Standards definitely drives um, a, a, a measure of consistency, but to some extent, there's been this, this, this problem in payments and in, in authentication for a while, and there hasn't been standards. And that means a number of people have stepped up and, and tried to create standards. The W3C and the FIDO Association and EMVCO have all tried to set standards for authentication. The regulators have set certain rules for how the authentication must be done. And you've got various different players trying to to pitch their approaches. So I think standards have got a great way of creating uh, a universal way of, of doing things, um, but there's some places where the standards overlap. And that's where you have to be careful that, that what you put in place is based, based on the principles and that you utilize the standards with a clear understanding of what they're there for and what they cannot achieve. Um, I think we'll see a lot more standards coming to bear over the next few years that will drive faster adoption for, for better user experiences. So why, why would consumers care about all these standards? Do they care about all these standards? Does it make a difference in, in whether they buy uh, another book or you know, get their dinner delivered to them or you know, get some clothes or send a gift to somebody? Is, is it really gonna make a difference? The statistics say definitely. Um, I think out of the billions of transactions declined every year, more than 50% of them is people that actually wanted to shop. And the machine said no. So they didn't have friction um, because they weren't challenged, but, but they didn't get the opportunity to say, yes, it's me. And I have decided to buy a dress for my daughter the first time ever because it's a gift. Please don't say I don't buy them. There's a reason. On the, on the flip side, I think there's a, there's a, um, a statistic that says, I think it's two thirds of customers that have, that have abandoned their shopping cart. So people that have said, I want to shop, I've made the purchase, I've filled in my address details, I've jumped through the hoops, but they get declined. They cannot complete the transaction. They want to, but they're, they're declined during the channel means because the challenge is too painful. What does it mean? It means abandonment. I think a number of people will drop that card. You're using it, losing an annuity income 
and you've got a bad, bad brand experience. And we know bad brand experiences. You talk to five, six other people about that experience. So banks have got a lot mm -hmm. to gain by getting it right. I don't know, Tim, I mean, when you're speaking to customers what, and banks, what are you finding? So um, two thirds abandon the cart. Uh, there's many reasons for that cart abandonment, but all of it, most of it comes down to trust, comes down to comfort, ease. Um, they find that the uh, requirements too difficult to fill in the data that they're being asked for. They don't wanna have an account, but the merchant is demanding an account be opened. Those things all add up to some level of an individual consumer making the decision, I want out, that this just isn't worth it. Um, so I would, again, I think we asked, are standards important? No, the implementation of the standards is critical. The standard has to be met, you can't get around it. What you need to do is find a way to implement that standard that continues to drive trust, continues to drive and communicate your brand to that customer across all the channels they operate across. Their primary channel is that card. That's what they use most of the time. And if they're not using your card, then you have a problem, right? They're not using your card because of some lack of trust or some lack of ease of use. And you need to address that. And if you can win that battle, if they use your card because they feel safe, because they trust you, because they know this is gonna be a good transaction, that trust permeates across all your other channels that use that same authentication mechanism. So I think it's, it's a matter of driving that trust and that confidence in the consumer that you know what you're doing, they know you have their back and they're ready to do business with you and that should not just work at the card level. It should work every time they go in on the web to look at the account, every time they ask to move money from their account to a friend's account, um, every time they go to apply for a loan. It has to be consistent. So, so are you saying that a bank that's worried, say, in mobile wallets and digital payments about pushing their cards to the top, that the, a key driver in that is going to be the use of a standards-based method of customer authentication? Absolutely. And and it yeah. it should be tied to the bank brand and to the bank's mobile app. So in this mobile first world, that mobile app should be the center of the bank's uh, uh, view to the customer. The customer should always know that mobile app is there and should always trust it. That means a secure channel back to the bank it means that it pops up only when necessary. It should be risk-based, not popping up all the time, driving the customer crazy. Um, and it, it gives the bank that opportunity to intercept the global wallets with their own brand, which is critical in this world. So can we talk yes, a little bit about, I was like, go ahead. If, if I can add to that, I, I think an important nuance here, and, and, and I think Tim put it very, very eloquently, is there's actually a bunch of different standards. Ways to tokenize, ways to do 3D secure, ways to log in. But that's not what the customer wants. That's the bank's problem. The customer wants consistency. So all of those different things should not be seen. And, and traditionally, the banks have seen them as separate things. This I'll do this, this I'll do this. They need to create a unified experience for the customer. Consistency, that consistency beats confidence. That consistent confidence brings reuse and brand loyalty. And that gets you front of wallet consistency. So, so different standards, same experience to the consumer. Totally agree. And by the way, you asked about U.S. banks and why do they care about PSD2? Well, mm -hmm. they... They, if they don't see the writing on the wall, then they're living in a different world, right? <laughs> California has already started right. to implement similar uh, requirements. Uh, they're going to be doing business, or some of them are going to be doing commercial business internationally. That they, they have to recognize that consumers are going to demand protection of their identities and the ability to opt in and opt out, and they should start planning that now. And they also have to recognize probably, well, no, definitely, again, the primary contact is through that card. That's what their 
card holders, their account holders recognize. And the card networks have regulations that are requiring and mandating a new type of authentication process. And gee, happy days, that same authentication process can work across all the other channels as well. So again, you make 30% of your revenue coming from that card base, I suggest you protect it, you adopt the regulation, and then you start using that same authentication method across your other channels. So we're actually getting a bunch of people coming in from other countries. So it's not the UK guys that's asking us about PSD. Right. It's the Latin American and the African banking customers saying, um, you know, I know this is coming. I'm seeing the writing on the wall. Is yours compliant? What lessons can I learn? How can I get ahead of it so that I'm pre preempting of it? I think in Europe, it's much more the, what's the minimum we can do to get to pass the regulation? I think the others see the time and they don't want to be caught lapsing. Um, so I think there, there's, there's actually a lot of interest from the rest of the world on PSD. It's definitely a shining light and a, and, and a guidance for a number of, of, of and, industry players. And some of those other regions have a slightly different angle as to why they need this. Fraud. The, the criminal activity within South America and some of the other countries is just off the charts. I mean, it's bad enough here in the US, but it's really bad in some of those other countries. So figuring out how to get authentication right and yet keep the friction low, keep the brand awareness within their customer environment is, is critical, which is also critical here in the US. Yeah, and, and everywhere, because I think fraud, especially during this time, has gone way up because so many more people are depending on and using digital mobile payments to do more than they did before. Um, in fact, even in a very cash-centric uh, society like the U.S., and still even where there are paper checks, there are cash shortages in places that you don't expect it, and a push towards digital that I think um, has, has banks worried from the banking perspective that they weren't before. Um, so it's really interesting to me that on the banking side, a lot of banks have depended on multi-factor authentication, one way of authenticating customers for anything you wanna do. And so what you're suggesting here is a different approach to customer authentication. And you mentioned it, I think, Tim, risk based approach. Could you talk a little bit about what that means? Um, so that the So thank you, Stessa, because it is critical. Um, having to force a consumer to face an authentication process for everything they do is just insane. You know, they want their balance. They shouldn't have to go through an authentication process for that. If you make a mobile, the mobile device, the center of what you do, you get your app into that mobile device and you start building identity uh, functions into it. That would include things like the device ID. That would include things like uh, behavioral biometrics. It would include uh, the location of the phone and the individual making the transaction. All of these can build a identification factor that makes you comfortable that the user interacting with you is indeed your user without having to push an authentication process, a step up authentication directly to them. If you have 90% guarantee coming from the phone that this is who you expect, that it's mm -hmm. in their hand, then you can go ahead and give them their balance. You could probably let them do a low value transfer if on the back end you know they make this transfer all the time. It's only if those two risk factors get out of balance. You know them 90% well, that that is who they claim to be, but the risk on the transaction is off is through the roof, in which case go ahead and push an authentication to them to make sure they really are who they claim to be. You know, maybe it's a $10,000 transfer out of the account. <laughs> Yikes. I think fortunately we're seeing, um, you know, a, a lot of new technologies coming to maturity as well. As Tim said, Behavioral biometrics is now uh, something that, that can with good accuracy detect a user. We're seeing new types of fraud emerge as well, like family fraud where behavioral biometrics can really help detect um, whether it's actually you and potentially even in a non-intrusive way, figure out that it is not Gerard that's doing this. So, so, so let's just do an out-of-band auth anyway, 
even though it's a trusted device, because it doesn't look like him and it doesn't make it a big deal, but let's just ask in a, a, a phone and device. And then Gerhard, the flip that's side, great. That, that, yeah. that would drive me nuts because my daughter has my debit card <laughs> in college, right? <laughs> I start getting the offs. Okay. <laughs> so banks have the opt out option for Tim. Okay, but I mean, fundamentally- On the um, other hand, I want all those alerts. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. yeah, so it's inform and act later. Um, but then on the flip side, we're also starting to see the browser stepping up. I, I constantly talk about these cycles. Everything used to be, you know, applications and then it was web and then there was the age of the mobile application. And we're seeing web coming up as, again. So it's important that banks consider various different channels. Everything right. from browser through to mobile and our, we really talk about intelligent friction. So, so being able to use the assets at your will. And let me give you an example. If I'm on a browser and the browser can already do Fido, we've seen Fido as a new standard or web of N mm -hmm. getting good prominence now with its recent induction in, into, um, into to iPhones and, and Macs as well. Maybe I could do a Fido authentication on the device. So I'm coming on from the phone, I've got much more kit available to make the experience better. Um, but with these new experiences and, and specifically new digital entrants, especially you talked about new people starting to transact, with that coming into the mix, we're getting um, the potential of confusion. Fraud is, is, is growing constantly and the one metric that's growing is social engineering. So by having a consistent, clear experience, knowing that the user is actually the person in control of all of the assets, so not, it's not a fraudster calling you to confirm the transaction and, and having you say yes, no. Those kind of activities right. are, are key um, to, 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 to prevent fraud and, and from people being, you know, breaking that trust. So I think you can help him, uh, help him a lot of times these days on the primary channel where he engages and use the elements available and then silently reach out to a mobile device potentially to see is the mobile device in proximity of the browser being accessed or the Xbox is, is close to the phone and you don't have to always do friction. And sometimes you can do friction, even if it isn't fraud, to, to prevent surprises. So it's about being smart with the, with the friction and not just following, right, let's hit with that hammer. We've only got one recipe we can execute. And so to be, intel yeah, and to be intelligent then, the bank that's doing the digital transformation initiatives, that's really taking a hard look at their delivery architecture, if you will, and maybe even also their core banking app applications that's transforming their architecture and looking at all their channels they want to look at customer authentication also across all these channels so that they can be intelligent about this and not say uh authenticate you on online banking only through one device and use everything at their disposal and this dovetails nicely into the customer experience and the cross-channel abilities that banks are looking for. I mean, how do you create a sticky experience if, if you're pushing the customer away and you're acting in an unintelligent way? Like, I don't know who you are, so every time I'm gonna ask you for your 12-digit password and your username and, uh, you know, I, I, that's the only way I can interact with you and all you want is your balance. That's a I great think, point, Stessa. I, I think about the challenge of getting a new authentication method out that utilizes mobile, a secure channel between the mobile back to the bank, utilizes new technologies to, to understand and it, I put a risk value on each customer is relatively easy compared to what you just pointed out which is understanding the risk at the transaction level across all of your different silos, figuring out, okay, now I'm 90% sure it's Tim or I'm 95% sure it's Tim, but what's the risk of this particular transaction Tim is trying to execute so that I can match those up and make a decision is the harder part because they have different systems, different uh, organizations operating across right. all of those environments. We often hear at Mercator about, oh, but but that's not going to work around the customer service channel because they're calling in on the phone. Well, no, it will. Are they calling in on their mobile device, which has your secure app that identifies them? Are they calling from home on a home channel? You know, are they using uh, a web browser to call in? 
all of those would be capable of being identified at the device level and would have avoid you having to challenge them when they call in to ask questions. Right, and, and, and this goes to the, the frequent yes but that I've heard from so many bankers over the years around integrating and putting all of their channels on a single architecture and platform. Well, we can't integrate the ATM and we can't bring it to the teller and customer service has all their own apps and, and so you end up only with the browser and the mobile device, which don't leverage each other at all. So what you're saying is actually, this is an opportunity for the bank to bring all of these devices together. I mean, I know in some countries, they do use mobile devices to authenticate customers at the ATM, which makes total sense to me, especially when you don't want to be touching those buttons, those dirty yeah. buttons during a pandemic. I'll tell you, my dream environment would be to walk into my bank branch, have my phone pop up the bank app to say, how can we help you today? I say, oh, I want to discuss a mortgage. Have it tell me up. Stessa it in Office 3 will be available in 20 minutes to talk to you about that. Please enjoy our coffee and donuts, right? And so I don't have to look around the, the branch figuring out where to go. The phone knows where I am. The phone knows who I am. The phone right. helps the bank communicate what I ought to be doing because they have that standard authentication method. Yeah. And, and maybe you want to start your transaction at home because it's convenient and you come in, you need to finish it at the branch. Maybe it's like a loan that requires a signature, but you can do documentation at your house, at your at your leisure, and it knows who you are, and there's less, you don't, you know, everybody's like, don't spend too much time in enclosed spaces, <laughs> you know, so this reduces that, and this capability is not there if your branch system doesn't talk to your mobile system, you know. I, I love the loan example, because I'm applying for refinance right now. My, <laughs> my financial institution that has two of my mortgages right now is putting me through hell and they have two different communication systems i email and then they send me to a secure email that doesn't allow me to respond to them i, I mean it's it's just a nightmare they don't know who i am they don't care who i am at the same time there are startups that are coming to me through the mail on a weekly basis i start to apply with them They've auto-filled all of the material that I'm being forced to upload from my own financial institution that has my two mortgages. It's crazy. They just haven't figured yeah. out how to nail down who I am, look at the regulations, and figure out how to collect the data without forcing me to go collect it, scan it, and send it to them. Yeah, and, yeah, and I think this is... If I, if I can maybe just come in here. Sure, I think sure. it's also great to have these discussions. And I think, um, you know, sometimes the question is, is what the, why can't the banks just do this? You know, don't they have UX people? And um, I think we need to recognize um, backwards to our first thing is these regulatory challenges. And I think we all want to get there. Right. And I think the challenge that a bank will face if it says, I want to get there tomorrow, they need to have a road there. And they need to have a clear vision. And then they need to set themselves up some key steps. And we, we've mentioned some of them. And, you know, the first thing is try to only get the guy to register his identity once. You know, let him not register, as Tim said, here and here and here and here and there. And then it's inconsistent. And then I have to go update my phone number in 20 places. Try to create a consistent place where you can at least register. You. Try to create places, trusted points where you can engage with the user. Try to create consistency and start off with, with, Every, every journey being something that you say, how can I bring in these trust anchors, these capable devices, and, and bring them in whenever you're looking at a reimagining? Train your UX people to think about it and add it into their journeys. And I think um, that's gonna get us there. But I think I just wanted to say, I mean, we all want that. I think the challenge is sometimes that the bank looks at this and said, it's too big. I can't pause for three years. You have to start. And you have to I, take that step. I totally agree, Gerhard. The, you know, I've worked with financial institutions a lot that have the, their uh, risk officers sitting in the room saying, no, 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 no. 
At the same time, their competition, other financial institutions are off making changes that are really lowering those friction points. So when you have a risk officer say no, because that'll put us in jeopardy with the regulators, send that risk officer off to go take a look at those that are doing it and say, then how are they doing it? Don't say no, tell me how they're doing it so we can do the same thing. Yeah, and maybe one of the challenges is taking a very siloed approach to customer experience development and delivery and saying, you know, maybe it's time to push the regulators out towards the customer experience people and the people who, who manage and architect the delivery and access of banking and products and services. So it's not, you know, the risk out here and the fraud out here but yes, they need to be part of looking at customer onboarding. And maybe we need to look at customer onboarding across all products. I mean, there's, I, there's a huge push around new account opening, but it's often focused in banks on mobile account opening rather than account opening everywhere. So Stessa, I, I'm talking to the FFIEC regulators in two weeks and <laughs> I'm gonna be talking to them about disbursement platforms and the complexity associated with establishing a disbursement platform around all the regulations and what the, they have to have additionally in their handbook when they go out and they try to audit these different platforms. They are thinking ahead. They, they understand the complexity of the environment and they also recognize it is therefore on the financial institutions responsibility show that they've thought it all through. And I don't think that's unreasonable. They're just saying, show us how you have tasks that line up to make sure all the regulations have been addressed. And it's stunning how many haven't done that. Well, I think one of the challenges that that's facing banks is the realization that um, as Garrett pointed out, no, they can't know the customer in all these places because they're in these silos, not only silos, but legacy silos that are yeah, really long in tooth and maybe past their lifetime, life expectancy. And so what you're seeing is a lot of banks quietly or not so quietly starting new banks uh, because there's simply no rehabilitating, upgrading, even migrating that old technology because it just, it's just not gonna do the trick. Um, and so I think you're, you're seeing that, okay, we have this digital transformation initiative, but part of that initiative is creating this new bank that we can then take this holistic approach. The thing I worry about is that banks will still overlook this process and say, okay, we're gonna do mobile onboarding, but forget about their ATMs. Yeah, but I, I think Stacey, to some extent, the the opportunity of starting new is something we all want, right? Because you know, I've, right. I've, I've been to some banks and I've looked at, you know, what percentage of your phone numbers is accurate as an example, or what percentage of your addresses are accurate and they, they, it's bad. So starting new also allows you to put the thing in place from the beginning and get that right. going. And that might be a nice way because invariably a bank, older banks are stuck with this problem. I have to cover all my customers, all hundred percent of them. And there's, 85% of you go, but 25, well, but 15%, sorry, is, is going to, you know, not be with it. And by getting a new bank, you, you might able to, um, to pre-select the right group and, and that the customer signs up for that, that great behavior so you can set them free. So that I think might be an approach could work for some banks. Unfortunately, you know, there's, there's still gonna have to be the stragglers that you carry along. A while back, we were involved in helping an institution under $500 million in assets evaluate their infrastructure. And one of the goals they set was to establish a payment hub, a payment platform API driven that would enable them to start deconnecting from the suppliers that they're using in the back end so that they could more easily bring in new technologies that would allow them to digitize and move at a pace that's different than their existing supplier. And, you know, that's expensive. It takes a lot of planning. It takes considerable amount of time. And yes, I believe me, I can feel the pain. On the other side of that, there's not a lot of time, right? 
uh, there's a lot of pressures that say we have to really figure out how we're going to do this sooner rather than later. Yeah. So, so banks that maybe even have this initiative of saying, okay, we're going to start a new digital first or bank where we can start from a clean slate, they still have to deal with their existing infrastructure. Um, is is there hope for them? In terms of in terms of using a solution that addresses it at the very least from the mobile and the browser based access. Of course, uh, is there is are there of, advantages? Of course, and you start with the card base and the card regulations that are demanding a new authentication method, and you go talk to Intersect and you say, okay, <laughs> how can we make this happen? And then how do we move it across all our other channels? I think See, banks simple. Are... <laughs> I mean, I, I think banks are in, in, in different spaces. As, as you say, Stessa, there are some that have got legacy silos. Others have started a journey to create a consolidated consumer identity and access management space. And the way you solve them is differently. In some cases, uh, it, it starts off with, with just creating, um, you know, a, a standardized integration for everything new. So making sure that new stuff comes up. Um, but, but I think, you know, perhaps the first step we need to get right as an industry and, and, and from our perspective is that people just understand what is possible. The amount of people I still speak to that thinks that authentication is this activity and it's bound by an SMS OTP and that an SMS OTP equals two-factor authentication. If they can just get a bouquet of the better options available. So maybe we should take all the UX people and put them on authentication courses because once you understand what's possible with great user experiences, the opportunity to integrate authentication as part of the journey, almost being a seamless experience. I mean, instead of saying, I'm going to do your transaction and now I'm going to authenticate you, you can combine those experiences and just making people aware of it will bring out those opportunities because we're constantly working on UX. That's and stuff that so many banks are investing in better user experience. Part of that user experience, you can create less clicks by bringing in smart authentication. So there's actually um, you know, upsell there if the if the banks can can get it right. So education and 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 being aware what's possible was probably already a good first step. It's it's fascinating, Gerhard, that NIST tried to identify SMS was uh, not to be used anymore because of the card swappers and the other simple methods that swapping. criminals can get into it. And the pressure from industries was so intense, they took that requirement down. They, they said, oh, okay, SMS is okay, keep using it. You go, oh man, what are you, crazy? It's time to move off of SMS as quickly as possible. And by the way, in doing that, you move your brand front and center every time you authenticate. Now it's through your mobile app. It's got your brand written on it. You can send other messages along with it. It it solves so many marketing problems as well as so many criminal problems, fraud problems, that it's amazing. Yes. And you can get an integrated experience because you, you know, right. even if you have an SMS OTP, you still need that password or that and 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 you can just have one fingerprint on a phone with that done. biometric sensor and you're done, you know not a password and then an OTP or a password and some other hoop to jump through, taking out a physical card reader and sticking a card in. It's a biometric fingerprint these days or a facial recognition and game on. Humans so, love consistency. And it, and it seems like that consistency not only builds a brand, but starts to separate banks, which tend to look very the similar, in, especially in their mobile apps and their browser apps uh, across across the board. I mean, they just have the same functionality. So if at least you can build, have a confidence and a trust factor you, that starts to differentiate you. It can push you to further differentiation in a time when, you know, everybody looks very, very much the same. Um, and then really push the customer journey in a new trajectory, as it were, because I've heard so often, oh, we, we're looking for the optimal customer journey and nobody talks about how they authenticate the customer in a way that's that's intelligent, if you will. So in extending the intelligent metaphor a little bit in making intelligent use of the platform that the bank is using for delivery mm -hmm. to leverage this technology, you know, intersect, you know, EMV code standard, 
to push out this intelligence from the very first interaction towards the daily use seems to be a, something, a stickiness, if you will, that's been so elusive in banking. I, that it's just, it's actually very provocative to me from the delivery and end of things because it's, it's almost like it's the missing ingredient, if you will, to all the conversations I've had with bankers and, and even customer experience and vendors looking to, how do you, how do you get the platform leverage to really differentiate customers? You know, it's, it's, yeah, it's not it's, how you transfer funds. <laughs> yeah, we started with regulations and I think the benefit of regulations is it forces a change. But then if you look at the regulation or the new standard as the, the thing, you're going to miss the opportunity. Regulation forces you to change. See it as a UX opportunity. See it as a way to get closer and get a better user experience with your customer. Use the, look at the products you buy and make sure that they can facilitate that. And if they can't, look again, because it is possible to create great experiences and make that your evaluation criteria, not whether it ticks the tick box, because then you're going to lose out and there will be others that don't. And then you're going to be left behind because you've missed an opportunity. Every customer journey starts by knowing who that customer is through some form of authentication. If you get that wrong, you've screwed up every customer journey you're trying to digitize. And it's not going to matter how much you know about the customer on the back end if you messed it up uh, and made it so difficult on the front end. Mm -hmm. um, I, I think that's that's a really good tying together of all these pieces. The, the regulations drive change and they force uh, standard uh, ways of doing things uh, and compliance, but also it affects the customer experience, bringing together consistency across, enabling consistency across platforms, technologies, lines of business, payments and banking, so that the bank can really leverage its digital transformation initiatives to achieve some transformation, starting with the first interactions with the customer, whether it's at a, a phone, in a branch or on an app. Um, I think that's that's pretty clearly in, in intelligent, using intelligent friction to uh, drive engagement and I think ultimately profitability, competitive sure. advantage. Right. Great summary. Thank you for a great discussion, Gerhard and Tim. Now we're gonna open it up for some questions. Hey everybody, if you could uh, use the chat box on the side to ask any questions. And Stessa, thanks, I can hear you. Okay, great. So we have one question. Um, my bank is more of a follower rather than an innovator or a first mover. What are the advantages and risks of my bank going with the EMV Co standard right now and implementing what we've been talking about cross channels? And I guess this would be for either or both of you. <laughs> I'll, I'll start and, and then Gerhard can jump in. I, I don't think there's a necessity to do it across all of your channels immediately. I do think you should be looking at how you can execute the <clears throat> 3D secure authentication on your card base as quickly as possible in order to, again, take that uh, channel that your customer uses more than any other channel and make it as convenient and accessible to the consumer as possible while managing your brand. And then you can start to consider where else you should be bringing it. Um, it, it, it can follow across your other channels in a, a sequence that makes sense to you relative to your infrastructure, your goals relative to customer relationships um, and, and that customer journey. But I, I think absolutely you should be thinking about how to execute the standard of the 3D secure standard today and execute it on the card base and then start thinking about moving it across other channels as well. And, and think about how other, your competitors are implementing it or not and what opportunities that represents for you. Gerhard, did you wanna chime in? 
I, I think I think if you're a follower, you should start following because it's time. Um, I think the reality is that um, the regulations in various places are already um, coming to bear early next year. In some places, it's already under pressure. So if you haven't started, you need to start running. You might get penalties. You will need to at least have a plan in place. Okay, and so one kind of unspoken thing here is that maybe one of the biggest risks is falling behind and not being able to catch up. And, and therefore, you know, so even if you're not a first mover, you know, or don't want to be an innovator, you could risk just losing business. Yeah, and, and, and having to, you know, take the wrong decisions and, and make crisis movements and, and not seize the opportunity that we spoke about. To do it the right way so I think the less time you give yourself the more you're going to fall into that trap of being in the hamster wheel right. so Again. so do either of you have have um examples of banks that are actually implementing emv co especially as a differentiator in customer acquisition whether it's in banking or with cards I mean, so you know, kind of going along the theme of, of financial services organizations who need to see has it been done before. Uh, do you have any examples or cases that you can? Well, I, I could say I mentioned the five hundred million dollar financial institution, and uh, <laughs> I, I can't say as they've executed it yet, but they do have a plan and are in the process of executing the plan to be able to implement it. Yeah, it's difficult in a public forum mentioning a bank's by name and uh, we, we treat that carefully but we've seen certain banks that have uh, implemented a, a risk-based approach or a bank in Europe that implemented a risk approach that I think their um, total volume of transactions in six months went up by uh, 15 to 20 percent uh, over that time and it was pre-COVID so um, it was it was massive growth and um, they fraud dropped. So by reducing friction, getting the right um, user experience in place, they've had growth in business revenue, and uh, their bottom line has also improved because the fraud has dropped. Well, well you, no, I was just going to say very quickly: the sorry. back end is again the harder, the harder area to impact to be able to understand the two risk factors. Um, that 500 million institution is still wrestling with that aspect of it. So you, you also kind of led me to the, the other question that I had um, here was how can we measure as a, as a bank the short-term ROI by implementing uh, the standard now and, and you, sort of, you started to get into some of the data that, that I find fascinating from live implementations because one, I think one of the pressures that this question is about is long-term ROI, sure, we get, but everybody's under pressure, especially around customer delivery, around how is this going to change in six months, right? Okay. Could you elaborate a little bit about what's how, how Intersect is measuring it and how banks are measuring ROI? Well, it's very difficult from a bank's perspective to to measure returning I mean they can measure certain returning factors but it's difficult to tie it back to a specific intervention or action over time uh, and with COVID these days all the baselines have been have been been quite confusing uh, for the customers um, uh, we're definitely seeing increases in e-commerce and with that initially um, we're seeing because of digital first customers we're seeing uh, you know initially a bit of a drop off uh, then after that, we see they stick. So they don't go back after COVID lockdowns and stuff into the kind of stuff. So I think that's the closest I can get to to current stuff. And, and I think it was to some extent 30% uh, up in terms of volume. And then you see that naturalization, that 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 new entrants becoming digitally active. And the, once they've had a good experience, they stay. Um, and then, you know, that flows ultimately through to the bank brand in terms of, of um, you know, revenue in terms of card card purchases and stuff. The other way to look at it is um, at least many of the institutions we work with are trying to figure out how they stay in front of their consumers with new technologies like P2P 
Um, they know that Venmo, as well as uh, other banks using Zelle, are starting to become more competitive and providing more feature functions to their to the uh, to their customers. And they feel that they have to respond in kind. In the process, there's a lot of fraud that goes on with P2P, and so a good authentication me mechanism makes a lot of sense. Well, well, great. I think I think that's all the the questions we have, and I want to thank everybody for joining the webinar today. Well, thank you, Stessa. Thank you, Gerhard. It's been fun. And thank Thanks. you guys for participating. No worries. Bye okay. now. Good week. Bye bye.